Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Thomas Anna Quinty from Ashesi University, and I'll be taking you through the D Lab content series. So today, that's basically what we'll be doing on this video. Now, what is design thinking? It's as if um, this is a new revolution of um, things coming up, and people don't basically know a lot about design thinking. So when we talk about design thinking, what are we talking about? Now, design thinking is a method is a methodology used by designers to solve complex problems and to find desirable solutions. You know, the world has become very complex. Therefore, they are, they are, people are looking for ways and means to get to solve problems. And that is what design thinking process is about. It's a holistic process that has been designed and structured so that we can use it to get the convenient solutions possible. Now, let's watch this video so that we have a general summarization of what the whole process is about. Suppose you are a part of a thriving business and need to branch out and find that next big thing. Or say you want to change a behavior, like getting people, a lot of people, to use less energy in their homes. How would you go about it? Design thinking is a powerful tool to tackle the unknown. It's a means of going on an expedition, without a map, without even knowing the destination, but with the confidence that you'll end up somewhere great. Let's make it tangible with an example that captures the five key elements of design thinking. Daylight was given the challenge of getting kids in America to move more, to help fight childhood obesity. The project started with an idea. Provide kids with a digital music player that has a motion sensor, then give them rewards based on their activity. But the big question was, would kids really use it? What could make the experience so compelling that they would use it long enough to see the health benefits? Learn from people. We began by talking with kids. We spent time in their homes and schools across the country. We listened to them share their motivations, habits, delights, and frustrations. The research included kids in the mainstream, but also incredibly active kids and the very sedentary. It turns out that those at the extremes are really good at giving a voice to problems that those in the middle might feel, but have a harder time putting their finger on. Find patterns. We captured our observations on hundreds of post-it notes and laid them all out to make sense of what we learned. Using informed intuition, we looked for patterns that pointed to opportunities. Daniel said, I get bored with solo video games. It's the multiplayer ones that keep me coming back. Meg said, I don't listen to music while I'm running because I want to talk to people. Define design principles. These quotes, along with others, revealed one of the design principles that would help us get to a successful concept. Facilitate social interaction at all times. Many such design principles emerged. Together, they formed the guideposts of an experience that we felt confident would resonate with kids. Make tangible. We asked ourselves, how might we questions? To bridge the gap from design principles to specific ideas, and then quickly turn the best of them into rough prototypes. Iterate relentlessly. Building physical devices out of simple cardboard and mocking up digital experiences with paper and pencil allowed us to learn quickly. With each prototype, we tweaked and evolved the concept. We brought digital and physical models to kids to listen and learn. The concept evolved until we got to a compelling solution. What we ended up with was a new product category. Before Fitbit and Apple Watch, we developed an activity tracker that gave kids a portal to an online world where they could share and celebrate their real-world accomplishments with each other and their families. In a six-month clinical trial, the impact was a 59% increase in physical activity. Learn from people. Find patterns. Define design principles. Make tangible. 
iterate relentlessly. Whatever the challenge, design thinking is a powerful tool to reveal new ways of thinking and doing. What in your world could benefit from design thinking? So why design thinking? Why do you think design thinking is very necessary and it's a process that we have to, to go through? No. With design thinking, we are able to get desirable results, very feasible results, and very viable results that can help solve the problem at hand. You know, everyone is talking about human-centered design, but only few people understand the outcomes of what the problem is. They focus on the human values with regards to with what is happening and how to embrace experimentations and enable diverse collaborations. Now, these are the general overviews that design thinking help us to arrive at. In doing that, we get to know that with design thinking, it assists us to be much more creative with our solutions. Because design thinking, the process is very involving and very, very lucrative. In the same sense, it's very good with poorly defined problems. In defining your problems, it helps the customers to meet their ideal um, problem solution. And finally, with design thinking process, it encourages us to go through a lot of experimentations that aids us to get to the main solution that we are looking at. So we'll take the whole process into consideration by breaking the structures down. Then we'll go to the specified parts that I have been assigned to talk about for this session. All right. So design thinking process is basically made up of five stages. Now the first stage is called defining of the problem. Then after that, we move on to the research. Then after the research, we go further to the analysis. Then after the analysis, we go to the ideation or ideate. Then finally, we go to prototype. All right, now in this, we can basically diagrammatically represent it in this sense. So for you to go through the process in a very explainable diagram, you kind of look for your problem, you redefine the problem, you understand what you are going through, you, ob you observe the kind of challenges around the problem, then you synthesize, whereby you do basic analysis around the problem, then out of the analysis that you make of, out of the problem, you can ideate solutions, possible solutions that can solve the problem. And finally, we go to prototype, where we go into experimentation, bringing up new ideas through innovations so that we can arrive at the solution of the problem. Then we test them to see how credible what we have made can solve problems in the world. All right, so basically, with this session, I'll be taking the, the, the research, the research, research and reframing. Somebody has already done the defining of the problem. So I'll be taking into details what research reframing is all about. So when we talk about research in design thinking, what are we talking about? Now, research is basically broken down into two forms. We have the need, the need for reframing. Why do we need to reframe the kind of problems that we encounter? To what extent do reframing help us to arrive at the analysis or the solution of the problem? And secondly, to what extent does the reframe question help us in our process of research? So that will be the first aspect of our work and then the research tool that we need. So the phase one will be taking the need for reframing questions. All right. Now there's a saying by a very wise man called Albert Einstein and he once quoted, if I had an hour to solve a problem in my life that my life depended on it, I will use the first 55 minutes to formulate the right questions. Once I have identified the right questions, I can solve the problem in less than five minutes. Now, this is Albert Einstein talking, and we can hold his words on credibility grounds. So he was saying, if he had an hour, he would basically five 55 minutes to go through the problem and redefine the problem so that he can really arrive at a solution. So, a question. So, for example, let's take a question like, what is five plus five? What is five plus five? Basically, when I said that, the answer 10 came into your mind, right? My second question would be like, which two even numbers can we add up to give us five? Now, that is a big question. You are thinking, you can add up a lot of even numbers to give you 10. My third question that I'll be asking, which two numbers can you add to arrive at 10? Now, I've asked you three questions. The first one is, what is five plus five? The second question is, what two even numbers can we add up to arrive at 10? And the third question is, what two numbers can we add up to arrive at 10? Now, these are three questions, and in solving them, we can use diverse ways to arrive at our answer. 
therefore, in the in research method, we have three avenues that we use in arriving at our, our, at our solutions. The first one is called the spy plane view, then the next one is the bull's eye, and then the last one is helicopter view. Now, when we are, when we are talking about the spy plane view, what are we talking about? For example, the third question is a spy plane view question. When I ask what what numbers can we add up to return? Now there are, po there are a lot of possible numbers that we can add from decimals to integers to rational numbers and all these can give us a possible solution of uh, numbers arriving at 10. Therefore, in working with spy plane view in asking questions, you get to know that you work on a broader work uh, work workspace because there are innumerable numbers to get your answers. You can see that there's a large range of possible outcomes. Adding two numbers to give you 10, you have large possible outcomes in doing that. And the last one is the best solutions takes time to notice. So for example, there are no choice of preferences with that. Therefore, we don't really make use of the spy plane. Now with the next one, bull's eye. You can see my first question is a question that falls under the category of bull's eye. I asked what is five plus five. So when I asked you what is five plus five, your mind went straight ahead to the answer. Why? Because with the bull's eye, in terms of doing research, you get to go on a narrow path taken, whereby you know specifically what your answers are going to be on the research grounds. Also, you have on spot con uh, conclusions. You don't need a lot of I mean, surveys, you don't need a lot of talks, but what you can see on the spot gives you the answers of what is happening. And the last one, there are no boundaries to push. With bull's eye, specific conclusions just come up. The last question was the second question, and I asked, what two even numbers add up to 10? With that question, you can see that adding even numbers are much more on a marginable space. And also, it, it's concise and very, very informative. Note, it is not too broad and it is not too narrow. When we are talking about even numbers in the numerical um, numbers, it is very limited. Therefore, we have a wider space that we can work with. Now, in design thinking, we basically work with the helicopter view because with that, we have a manageable space that we can work around the problem doing the research part. We also get concise information through the re service, the research that we do, and then we, are, we don't go too broad into the whole the whole problem and we don't go too narrow into the problem but we take a marginal stand where we can have a general overview of the problem and take a hold of it all right now question so for example i'll ask a question and then we are going to redefine reframe the question and see how effective design thinking process can help us in doing this so for example Let's say I meet a lady, Ajoa, and I ask Ajoa, Ajoa, do you like cooking? And she answers, I hate cooking. Now, when she said, I hate cooking, I have limited, I have a limited answer of what she just said. Maybe I don't know why she's saying that. I don't know what are the outcomes or the possibilities as to why she's giving me that question. So the question that I asked, maybe we can reframe it in a better sense and through that we can get much more uh, plausible answers. So the best way I can reframe that question is using this processing. Now in this processing, I can ask the before, the during and the after processes as to why she doesn't like cooking. So I can ask her, why don't you like cooking? What are the before things that you do that, you, that makes you hate cooking? Then with that, I get to know much more in a researching manner. What are the before processes that lead her not to like cooking? Maybe she can say she has to go to the market and that is stress for her. Then I can, with through that, I can get to know much more about the before processes. Now with the during processes, what I can ask her during cooking, what are some of the things that make her makes her hate cooking? Then she can be like, when I'm cooking, there's too much heat around me, and sometimes there's stew in the water. Maybe sometimes comes out of the pot and then it burns me. I have a lot of sensations and I feel very tired going around cutting onions and all that. So this also helps me gives me a manageable space to work within my problem. The last one can be the after. So I can ask her, what are some of the things after cooking that makes you hate cooking? And she can be like, okay, when I'm cooking, I have to now wash the dishes, clean the kitchen, and do all those things. And this is why I hate cooking. Now, can you see, when I asked her the first question in the bull's eye perspective, I said, why don't you like cooking? And she said, I hate cooking. But when I took the helicopter view, I had a manageable space whereby I could find it during the before and the after processes and I could expand the whole problem and then now take a very good look at it as to how I can help her solve the problem.
okay now in doing this we have some methodologies that we use to arrive at our solutions and we are going to take it in the next phase so that we can get a proper preview about our research okay so we are going to do that through the ethnographic research and then the research method and that's going to be the first two of our presentation okay so ethnography when we talk of ethnography what are we talking about basically ethnography is a research that was developed by anthropologists as a method to study cultures through immersion in the culture of a significant period of time the word ethnography means portrait of people aims to understand the way in which people live from the emic that is the insider perspective versus the ethic that is the researchers outsiders perspective so basically what ethnographers basically do is that they kind of immerse themselves with the people whereby the researcher goes to his field of research and tries to go deeper to understand through the societal living their customs their belief system so that he gets a broader picture of it so this is basically what ethnographers use now when you go into a society we are the visuals that you can work with in your research processes so you can know about maybe you're looking for a problem you can know you can get to know more about the problem through the food that is a, a physical aspect of it their literature their dance their visual acts these are the literature these are the physical aspect that can help with your research method but with ethnography we get to know that no there are certain hidden figures that can help us get a holistic view of our research uh, processing therefore we can take the norms the belief systems the percep percep perceptions about the people the assumptions and all these things give us a general idea as to how we can attack the problem through our research now how do we go about this with ethnographic research the video actually gives us the ways and means that um, this whole processes go through for us to arrive at the solution and in doing that we have various disciplines of ethnographic research methods that are also used in the research field to kind of elucidate on the problem in question so the first one is called depth interview then we'll be moving on to observational shadowing immersion experiment and then on the diary methods so for example so with depth interview this is when the researcher goes to um, the people and then kind of have an interview with them. They talk to the people and try to coll collate data from them through speeches by recording and then also with their right parts to collate every information that they get from the people. And that is how far the interview goes. With the observational shadowing, basically in that process, what the researcher does is that the researcher takes a day and then follows the person that we are that has been interviewed on that day through his daily routine to know his daily routine as to as con, as con, as compared or as concerned with the problem so the researcher will go to the, if it's a farmer for example when i was doing my research in design the design lab content series or in the thinking process we went to a farm so basically we had to go and spend a whole day with the farmer in doing observational shadowing as to know how he goes through his day as a farmer from the farm to his day in the farm the kind of activities that he engages what are his deficiencies what is causing or adding up to the problem and as you do the observational shadowing you get to know more about the effects and the causes of the problem so that is what observational shadowing is all about now with the immersion that is a bit tricky whereby the researcher really empathizes with the problem and the people that are in the problem so with the immersion aspect what the researcher does is that he kind of immerses himself with the problem just to have a feeling and to be in the shoes of they that he's researching on so with this he gets much more of the pain gain of what his people the people that he's researching are going through and then with the experiment this is when um, the general observations are made and then through the general observations made a prototype or um, a, me a mechanization is formed up and with through this mechanization they use it to collate result as to how the people use the experiment to i mean solve much more of those problems all right next slide all right the other aspect of it apart from the research method is also called adaptive reasoning 
So with the abductive reason, this is where logic comes to play. In asking people questions, how do you beat around their minds to get so much information that is so that is in, that is cons, uh, concise and can help you reach a very wide range of solutions possible. So we also make use of the abductive reason. Now with the abductive reasoning, there are three folds of them. We have the deductive logic, inductive logic, and with the abductive logic. So as the slide shows, with the deductive loaded logic, it leads down and it says conclusion is guaranteed true. So with deductive, what we try to do is that they try to reach conclusions by the use of the rule and preconditions. So with this, the researcher tries to beat around the people's mind to get to know the true facts of what is happening. And sometimes in using deductive logic, maybe the researcher goes specifically on the, the problems and sometimes he might not really get what he's looking for. With the inductive, it says lead it into, that's like the immersion. So conclusion is probably true. So with the inductive, it makes more, much more of the use of immersion, whereby the researcher really goes into the conclusion process with them. So in this aspect, he makes use of the rules of researching in order to get that by the use of preconditions and also by, yeah. So that is how he comes about with the conclusion being probably true for him. But what basically research method relies on is the abductive logic and this one is to lead away and in doing this conclusion is the is best guess now you should know that the research is not to get you to the solution of the problem but with the research what it helps you to do is that the research gives you information surrounding the problem so that we can arrive at the solution so with this it, the conclusion helps us to make possible guesses around the, the problem. So this is how the helicopter view comes to play. So we have a lot of solutions around the problem. Then through our research, we can really drive safely to the solution that we are looking for. That is what the logical aspect of abductive reason helps us to come by. All right, so I think this will be the end of the research session next week. Another person will be coming in with the analysis and then through that we go on to the very end of this prototype. Thank you very much for your time.